When we went around in the bonding trip last, uh, actually now it's working on about a year and a half ago, well, every community we went into across the state, and we got into a lot of different communities, I think we, we probably had four or five hundred different uh, stops. Most of these communities had a uh, worker shortage, and in particular, a skilled worker shortage. And many of them said they just can't find uh, enough uh, people to hire. And in fact, my, my community back home, which has a newspaper, uh, it comes out twice a week, has four pages. You wouldn't think that a small community of roughly eight, 9,000 people would have four pages of want ads, help wanted uh, ads for you know, people. And they're busing people in from 60 to 100 miles around the city of Thief River Falls. And this was occurring not just up in Thief River Falls, it was occurring in Jackson, it was occurring in, in um, uh, almost every community we went to. So what, what this proposed legislation is trying to get at is a way to encourage young men and women, and I say young men and women because the way the legislation is set up, once you have your high school diploma, um, you can automatically apply for this uh, uh, particular uh, grant type program. Um, and it is a, um, we're trying to also get at it. One more factor is the diversity. So we've included uh, the GED, and we've also included the, uh, um, take a look here, we've included the uh, ABE program. So those, those people who have uh, not gone through the traditional high school but have gone through a, an alternative type high school and have gotten a GED or ABE uh, certificate can also go into the, um, this grant program. The, I think the most important part of this program isn't paying for the two years of college uh, tuition, but it's the mentorship connection behind it. And <clears throat> for years, and I've been here a few years, we've all tried to um, figure out a way to make uh, college, going to college successful. We've had a number of different problems over the years. And one of them is, you know, we have not been able to get uh, some of our, our more diverse populations into college. We can look at it and say, well, college is too expensive, and it is, um, and they can't afford it. And so what we're trying to do here is try to address some of that. And I can remember on the bonding trip, we were up in North Minneapolis and we were talking about uh, the, I believe it's the, the um, help me out, the light rail train that's going to go north up, uh, um, what? Botnell. The Botnell uh, uh, light rail. Um, and I said, you know, up here you have, you know, a, a, a lot of men and, and women that could get good jobs when that botanal goes up through North Minneapolis. And uh, we have such a huge need for mechanics and heavy equipment operators and, and construction of, uh, 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 people of all different categories. And so um, this would be an opportunity for many of those, those uh, people to take advantage of a two-year program, get a skill, and and consequently have a job that pays very well. Um, the way this works is, as I mentioned earlier, right after you get your degree, your, your uh, certificate, high school diploma, you can sign up and, um, and go get into the program. The higher education office will have the forms and everything. And, uh, and then you will be um, um, asked and to fill out a FAFSA, which is, is basically 
what right now all college students fill out, the, the federal application for student aid, and you'll be asked to fill out the state grant um, uh, forms, which are based on the FAFSA. And so the, the program is basically what we call the last dollar uh, uh, program. So those two grant programs would uh, come first, and then the state would fill in the remaining portion of that um, uh, demand or cost for the student. And then the, the, um, the student would, would uh, get a mentor, and that mentor would then be a person who would um, be, I suppose, best categorized as a helper. Someone who would be sure that this student does everything <clears throat> possible to make, be successful and go through the, uh, uh, the college and get their certificate or diploma. And I think that in the, the evidence in Tennessee was that that is a very, very important component of this, this legislation. Can you talk a little bit about the mentorship program? What they mean with these students once a year, once a semester? Do you know what that would look like? The, the mentorship program <clears throat> is, um, is going to be more intense than that. And I believe they have to uh, be sure that they meet with them, I think, is it once or twice a week? And uh, so that they have to uh, be, be sure that they're not only um, talking to them about uh, things like, you know, have you been going to class or things like that, but also uh, are you, are you um, learning the social kinds of skills that you need for that particular job that you're, you're trying to uh, get a degree or a diploma through, uh, financial planning, uh, a whole host of things. So it's a very comprehensive type of mentoring. And, and I think that's where a lot of the, the um, shortcomings come in and when students go to college and do not have that type of a mentor, uh, it really puts students at a huge disadvantage. When I look at our three uh, children that have gone through college. The first one was aggressive. Um, she was uh, uh, ended up, you know, being homecoming queen, and she was in all kinds of different activities. Our second uh, child was very uh, shy, and uh, would probably not have gone to college except the oldest one grabbed him and said, "Come on here, I will help you out. I'll do your financial aid." Uh, uh, stuff and analysis, and the same way with the third child. So I think if you don't have the support system, uh, either parents or uh, a mentorship, you can be uh, very likely to fail at uh, along the way. When you first talked about this in late January, you had estimated uh, sort of a guess of 100 to 150 million dollars uh, providing it as cost. And it would serve an estimated you know, 25,000 students or so. Now, this has really gone down. Could you sort of explain how you got that pool of students down? Was it through cost capping of some way of qualifications? Sure. Um, well, first of all, early in January, we really didn't have a handle on, on the, a lot of the statistics of, of, uh, that, that we needed through the higher education office. Um, but we do basically have a cap on it. Right now, when you look at the financial aid uh, uh, programs, in at least the state grant programs, they um, will go up to about, um, I think it's roughly 50, 60, 70,000, and then pretty much drop off. So that there really isn't any uh, state assistance into those income levels above that. This takes it much higher, and it goes up to about $125,000. And so it's still capped uh, above that amount. But because it's the last dollar um, effort put into it, that was what really lowered the cost a lot, because you have first 
the federal uh, grant money, secondly, the state grant money, and then this particular program uh, would fill in that other gap. Um, so I think that that's, those are the factors that kind of brought the overall cost down. Now you had 20, the estimates were about 25,000 students would be served. Now you're bringing this down to 3,000. Is it academic qualifications? I mean, that's a huge decrease in the number of students served, which is um, got to be more than just income caps. Well, I think, I think the, the, um, uh, obviously any new program, I mean, we're starting out uh, the first year would be, you know, like if we get get it off the ground so that students next year can can take advantage of it. Um, you start out in kind of an uphill um, growth, so I think I think um, the numbers would go up as as um, the programs in place and operating. So the 3,500 students is is an initial two year. Uh, estimate of, of how many students would be able would be in that program. 